thanks everyone for coming. So before I introduce our uh, distinguished guest, we actually have a couple of other additional guests that I thought I would mention. So we have Steven Zirk and his mother, Marina. Uh, actually, I'm not sure his mother's name really matters because from this moment on, you're going to be known as Steven Zirk's mother for the rest of your life. <laughs> so Steven has just returned from Greece where he won the World Youth Chess Championship sponsored by the International Chess Federation. <laughs> Turns out that Stephen is actually a senior at Los Gatos High and took classes with my son, my nephew, and I'm sure is looking out for my younger daughter, Hannah, who is a sophomore. So Stephen, <laughs> thank you for joining us. You can sit down. <laughs> so, back in March, I read an article by Gary Kasparov in the New York Times Review of Books, and it was a review of this book called Chess Metaphors by the Spanish author Diego Raskin Gutman. And I'm passionate about is issues related to innovation, as most of you know, and a bunch of Gary's comments in the article basically focused on the poor state of innovation in computer chess, and one of the things that he observed was that because brute force programs played chess so well, there was little innovation on any other kind of approaches. And another one of the things in the article that many of you guys mentioned was that it talked about how mixed human plus computer teams could compete in chess. And the outcome of one of these tournaments was that amateur players with basically garden variety PCs won against much more formidable opponents. So it turned out, if you read the article, that weak humans plus machines plus very, very good process trump a strong computer by itself. But even more surprisingly, a strong, uh, even more surprisingly, a strong human plus a computer with not as good process, which is a compelling argument for very good UIs, I would think. But there was lots of applicability, I thought, in this article to some of the things that we think about at Google. And many of people suggested that we should bring Gary here, so we did. Um, if you don't already know, uh, Gary Kespar became the youngest undisputed world chess champion ever when he won the title at age 22 in 1985. Steve, you have four more years. <laughs> so 20 years later, he retired from chess as the highest rated player in the world. Many people consider him the greatest player to ever play the game. And he's a widely published author on a whole bunch of different subjects from leadership on leadership and strategic thinking. And he's a significant player and active in Russian politics. So I thought we'd get started with Udi. I think we have a slide. Udi <laughs> wow. played a simultaneous match with Gary in 2005. I suppose I could ask Gary what the outcome of the match was, but. <laughs> I don't think it was particularly remarkable. So, Udi, I'll just ask you, how many moves did you last? Uh, I actually lasted 23 moves, which yeah. was a lot more than I expected. Where did we play? This was in San Francisco. Hmm? In San Francisco. San Francisco. Yes, that's the... So I know Udi right has some you. questions, which I thought maybe we could start About the with. game? <laughs> <laughs> actually, I can tell you a story about this game. OK. Uh, that way you Go ahead. This. Have at it. So, when somebody asked me just before we played, this was a simultaneous game. Um, so somebody asked me, what do I think my odds are? And I thought about it for a second. I said, well, I think about a billion to one. Um, and he said, no, you got it wrong. Uh, you'll have to make every move exactly perfect for about 50 moves. And even if you know chess, you know, it'll be about five choices per move. So it's five to the 50. It's way over a billion. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, no, 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 you got it all wrong. That's not how I figured it out. I was trying to figure out in my head what are the odds of the chandelier falling on his head in the middle of the game. <laughs> <laughs> the, odds are, the odds are much better that way. <laughs> so then uh, the game was played uh, in the Palace Hotel in San Francisco. Yeah. And we entered the game. You can see there it's a really big room, huge high ceiling with a huge chandelier right in the middle. Uh, so during the game, I had There was to, no earthquake that day. That's right. So luckily, the odds were right, uh, and the chandelier is still there. 
but I had to avoid from laughing and looking up to the game. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, okay. Just to follow this, the, the subject you touched just briefly about the numbers you know, okay. and the odds. So this, this, when we talk about chess and computers, the general crowd always gets confused saying, wow, it's, it's a chess, you know, what the game, 64 squares, 32 pieces. So how long does it take for, for a machine to sort of to, to, to finish the game off like it happened with checkers to solve the game? Uh -huh. So just uh, people just don't understand that if, you know, I don't know whether we can calculate the number, but according to the so-called Shannon paper published in 1950, the number of all legal moves in the game of chess is 10 to the power 120. It's quite a big number. Because it's considered it's the, another tentative number of 10 to the power 78, which is the number of atoms in the observable universe. So that's why chess so far is safe from being oh. cracked by the computers. But of course, you know, it's uh, the, uh, so the Moore's law was good enough to guarantee that uh, in the, the, uh, from the practical terms, chess uh, was solved by computers in less than 50 years because machines now are probably beating every player, capable of beating every player. I was about to Am say, when you come to Google and you say things like this, you just present a challenge. Challenge of <laughs> what? <laughs> to do that. To do that? So, so which number you have in mind? The 10 to the 120. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, you know. Maybe okay. we'll, we'll go with well, both questions from the audience, and if you guys can give us the Dory questions, we'll try to incorporate yeah. as many of those. Udi and I also have questions, but if we could flip here to the Dory, that would <laughs> let me, let me help. Start. But I know Udi has something he wanted to start with. Um, oh. so obviously, in chess. Nice start. Want to do this? <laughs> nice start. Uh, yeah, by the way, this is, okay. that's, 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 that's a very good question, you know, uh, because it's... Oh, our tradition is that we read the question so okay, that, fine. So that they can all see it. Oh, so yeah. the, the first question, by the way, the first thing Gary said, just to show you, Udi and I have worked hard to prepare some brilliant questions. He's a fan of James Surowiecki, and when we told him about Dory, he immediately said, well, that must be better than whatever the two of you think. Mm. So he likes the first question better than ours in any case. Yeah. The first question is, can you explain what made you claim that game two moved 37, presumably. Yeah, bishop, before. bishop to e4 was a move that a computer couldn't have made. Do you still believe IBM cheated? Um, no, it's, uh, it's I say, they say, but you know, uh, we can probably try to reach a scientific uh, conclusion in, in, in measuring our statements. Um, the only problem is that you know, at the end of the match, they dismantled the blue, and I said they killed the only impartial witness. <laughs> Um, um, it's, it's actually related to the subject that you touched. It's, 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 it's from, the, from my article about you know, man versus machine and actually man plus machine. And uh, when, I, when we talked about this game, the game two, and I made a claim, and I'm still behind this claim, that uh, there was some kind of uh, uh, artificial interference, that time human interference, uh, people asked me, uh, what did, did you mean? That was Anatoly Karpov, a very strong player behind the computer? No, which is, it just, it showed this, this that the, the crowd didn't actually understand the whole nature of possible interference. Because when we have a game, say a game between two computers, one or two advices from humans could change everything because you don't have a very strong player actually to help machine, to guide machine, and just to give um, this human judgment, you know, intuitive judgment, strategic judgment to uh, uh, make sure that machine doesn't go the wrong way. And other way around, so you have two humans playing, one or two um, advices, quote unquote, from the computer could be, could be decisive, even a hint that there is the combination there. So, because very often when we play, we don't know whether you know, the, it, um, something that is tempting is, is going to work. I remember I played it in, a long time ago, in 1996, at the very big tournament, I played against Vichy Anand, the current world champion. Um, and uh, I thought I was winning, and I saw the combination, but it was too long, and I just calculated for about half an hour, just move seven, move eight. I smelled that, you know, there was a blood there, but I eventually decided to go for a safer uh, route, also keeping an advantage. And then after the game, my coach asked me, why didn't I do that? I said, look, I couldn't see it. And he said, wow, the machine, even 96, already showed, you know, that it was winning. So just a hint that it was the right way to go, could it force me to, to go deeper and to find a solution. Now, what's happening in game two and why I made this claim is that um, 
Deep Blue, again, from what we know about this computer, and the problem is that there's not enough information to analyze because, as I said, they dismantled it, and uh, all scientific tests made later, when they put the games I played against Deep Blue uh, to be analyzed by other computers, modern computers, much weaker computers you know, in terms of uh, brute force of calculation, but with more chess understanding, showed that Deep Blue was not exceptional. So the, 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 the machines today, they are, they, they are doing better by going through, through all these games. And um, uh, to make a very solid positional move, instead of winning three pawns, sort of uh, uh, gaining decisive material ad uh, uh, advantage, was highly unusual for a computer of that strength. Um, what I wanted to see, I wanted to see the, 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 the logs. So they never pro produced the logs. And it's actually the same things happen in game five. But at the end of the day, okay, it was my mistake. You know, I didn't uh, put enough pressure to, to, to uh, uh, secure the integrity of the game. And uh, recently, by the way, um, there was an interesting interview of one of the seconds, quote unquote, seconds of assistance of the blue Spanish grandmaster Miguel Olescas uh, in, in the chess magazine, New in Chess, the most popular chess magazine. And some of the stories he told about this match, they were, again, could be used as a consequential evidence to support my, my theory, even the fact that uh, upon the request of the team, IBM team, the IBM corporates, you know, uh, change the, the, the guards uh, next to, to, to my green room, making sure that these guards speak Russian to, uh, to communicate all information they could gather from my conversation with my coach. Okay, consequential evidence. So just following okay. up on that, if we assume that IBM did cheat. Uh, no, IBM won this. No, no, let's, oh, let's, let's, there was a let's, human. Let's, let's, let's use you know, diplomatic statements. For IBM, oh, you're, in, you're a diplomat winning. now. I no, I'm not a diplomat, you know. I'm, I'm, just, not a, I, I'm not a diplomat. Yeah, but I, so just, I, was gonna I don't want to involve cheated. lawyers too often, yeah. Uh, I, uh, um, it, they didn't even hide the fact that for them it was about winning or losing. So they did everything to win. And uh, certain things that happened in the match, even the fact is that they were very, you know, uh, following the, the, the uh, story of Miguel Alescas, they even knew the opening I would play in the last game. Eh, okay, by accident probably, you know. It's, it's, Considering the fact I never played it before in my life, or never after. Yeah. Um, yeah but it's, you know, IBM shares uh, jumped 22% during two weeks. So that they was got the what big... they wanted. They did. Well, okay, that's happened, you know, they said too. Uh, they wanted to win badly, and uh, uh, for me, it was more of the scientific or social experiment, and I, I expected this to, be, to, to continue, and I. I asked for the rubber match because I won the first match in Philadelphia. They won the second match. And as I said, you know, they immediately dismantled the computer. That was a really bad sign. So yeah. what kind of things would tell you if you were engaged in a match that would be a clear tell that a human had become involved? Intuitively, what are the types of things that would actually just there, you know, almost be a smoking yeah, gun the, to you that yeah, would say that. Okay. Again, let's, let's, uh, let's do the opposite now. In, 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 in a big chess playing uh, um, websites now, for instance, playchess.com, you have the, the, the anti-cheating system. So the, the computer actually looking for games played by some players, and the moment it sees too many games made by compute, or uh, not made, but uh, potentially made by the computer, it assumes that there's a cheating. So it's, uh, as for the game, you know, uh, um, game two or other games I played with a computer or computers playing each other, you could, if you know enough about the machine, if you know enough about the decision-making algorithm and about the priorities, because every machine at the end of the day, you know, has to operate with, uh, uh, with a preordained system of priorities. For instance, it's, it's all about numbers. If you put, you know, sort of the very high numbers on king security, uh, uh, king safety. So uh, it will stay the same way. You cannot, machine cannot uh, uh, regroup these priorities based on, on, on the character of the position. So if you can understand uh, more or less the, 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 the concept be behind this, the decision making algorithm, you will feel immediately that there, is the, you know, there was an in interference. And 10 years ago, I said that in, I would need 15 to 20 games to identify the playing program, whether it was Fritz or Junior or another one. Now machines are getting, you know, sort of more sophisticated. There is, is sometimes, you know, some kind of uh, intuitive element in the game because um, um, there are more sort of uh, more flexibility in uh, sacrificing the material, actually accepting the fact that, you know, other uh, factors could, uh, could uh, uh, trump 
just material advantage, but in back in 1997, it was impossible. So machine turning down a very generous offer to win huge material uh, for, you know, positional, um, mm, uh, to for, for, for a move to increase positional pressure, I didn't believe that. Um, actually, Ken Thompson is here in the audience, yeah. and I remember Ken was watching the screen. Yeah, I saw him. <laughs> that he had some inside information. I don't know if you want to share with us later yeah. about that. <laughs> Ken was one of the judges of that, uh, of that game. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, let me take one question, in, a general question about decision making, or you rather go with? No, no, you, 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 it's up to you, um, you know? I'm yeah. a guest. Um, <laughs> and by the way, there's a very simple way to add intuition to computer programs, and I've learned that a long time ago. You just introduce bugs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very good at that, too. Um, so my, my question really is that part of being a really good player is not just making the right moves, but knowing how much time to spend thinking about every move. And that's one thing we don't do in business that much. We usually, the time we spend is proportional to the importance of the decision. How do you know the importance of the decision? Estimate. But not even that. I'm, I'm sure that's not How even much the best strategy. You spend to, to make an this, the, the correct estimate. <laughs> so my question to you exactly is what should we do? How much time should we spend? And how, how do we decide how much time to spend on a decision? Because that's what you do in every game. Uh, no, in, in chess, we are, I'm retired. So I just, okay. I, you know, my chess experience is five years old. So I, I don't play professional chess now. But in chess, you are under time constraints. So you have whatever, two hours, you know, for 40 moves or, you know, half an hour for the whole game. So you know exactly, you know, your uh, sort of the time allowed for you to, to make all the decisions. So you have to adjust. Obviously, if you play uh, uh, rapid chess or blitz chess, sure. you, you, you have to understand that you sacrifice the, the quality of your decisions to make sure that you are not losing on time. So uh, at the end of the day, as I argued in, 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 in uh, my book, How Life Imitates Chess, uh, every decision, whether it's made at the chessboard, in business, uh, at home, you know, in the White House, it's all, you know, all, every decision contains components of material, time, and quality. And uh, while material and time is understandable, then the quality is, is, is a factor that we all have to uh, adjust to, to, to our decision-making system. Where women could be comfortable with, with, with uh, um, sort of with uh, micromanagement or just looking at the big picture, at the end of the day, it's it's all unique. So I don't think that there is the universal advice for 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 some for, for anybody who wants to make an unchallenged decision. Some people should do it quicker because if they spend more time, you know, they going they going around. So some people should take you know more time because they need you know to look at every element. It's, it's, it's absolutely, you know, unique as uh, DNA or fingerprints. Okay. So it no. looks like all the Googlers want to get better at chess. So the next question is, what is the best way for somebody who does not quite have the time to devote their life to chess to improve their game? Now the, the, the counter question is, if you don't have time to devote uh, your life for chess, why do you want to improve the game? <laughs> 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 so it's... <laughs> it's just to beat your neighbor, to impress someone, or to catch up with your kids. So uh, yeah, now with computers, I don't know how much time you can allow to, 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 to play chess you know, while you're here. So, but definitely, you know, on, on, with, 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 with the computer technologist, you can do a lot, even without reading books. But uh, I think that's there, there are always there, there are limitations, because there are so many kids now and so many people who have more time to, to, to spend on chess, and it will be quite a challenge. Okay, let's go to one in the yeah. audience here. So you were the youngest world chess champion. I was. But you could have been the youngest world chess champion at 21, right? Can you talk about the politics around what happened with that match where you didn't become? Ah, you mean 1984, yeah? Uh, it was a long time ago, and uh, uh, it's uh, definitely, you know, you, you're some kind of chess expert because you, I guess you read enough books to remember this match. How old you? Were you were born. Yes. Yeah, you were, yeah, let's say. How old are you? 29. 29. You were born. Oh, just okay. Just, uh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Nurse, nursery school, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was, I was, remember, I was trailing behind badly, you know, losing five to zero, so Karpov had to win one more game. 
to um, retain the title. He couldn't win this game. Eventually, I won three more games, was catching up. And then the match was stopped and um, started again seven or eight months later, eight months later. Um, and uh, there was a clear case of interference by Soviet officials. I think they just they, they believed that it would be you know, too much um, uh, pressure on Karpov to, to continue the game. Uh, I, I didn't like it, so the official decision made by International Chess Federation stated clearly that Karpov agreed, Kasparov obeyed. So, but uh, look, at the end of the day, I won the title. And this match was a great lesson for me because it probably uh, uh, made uh, sort of the, the ultimate mark on my character. So trailing ba uh, so badly, losing uh, uh, beyond any hope to, 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 to survive, and eventually surviving and beating Karpov uh, eight months later, you know, it was a, a proof, proof to me that uh, there's no situation you, you, uh, in, in your life where you have to give up. So that was a very, very good lesson. So I'm grateful to Karpov for helping me to, <laughs> to, to build up my character. Thanks. Okay. Should we? Okay. Why don't we let okay. We want to take the next question from the Dory. This is. No, but it's, someone is already about okay, to ask the question. Oh, please. Great. Uh, I'm really curious about what you would tell us about your learning curve. So at 23, you're the best player in the world. Were you better at age 30? Were you better at age 40? When you retired, were you the best you had ever been? Can you just talk a little bit about, did you ever plateau, and, and some of the factors around your learning? Uh, I, I'm always very cautious when I'm asked to, uh, uh, to, to compare players from different epochs. So that's, let me start, you know, uh, uh, with, with some, some general, uh, uh, with general response. Um, now, you ask me to compare Gary Kasparov of 1985 to 1995 and 2005. Um, you know, I, 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 I played chess, and I, you know, my, my professional chess career, I mean, could be divided in, 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 in probably, you know, just in, in some sections. I'm actually writing now the book about my, my best game, Kasparov and Kasparov, so I'm, I'm working now on the first volume. So that's why I'm you know, probably too sentimental to talk about <laughs> those, those, those early days. And it ends with the World Championship match in 84, 85. Um, I think that probably I had two peaks in my career. One was the uh, late 80s, 89, when I broke Fischer's record, uh, the, the rating, 27, 85, which was, you know, uh, many people believed would be you know, staying for very long. I crossed 2,800 mark. And when I, now that, that many players did it, I mean, right now I think there's three or four. Uh, but at that time, you know, uh, when there were no players in 2700 categories, so only, only Karpov, that was quite an accomplishment. And then it was um, probably inevitable um, downside in the career because I was, in early 90s, I had to face a younger generation. And that's, that, for me, was the, the biggest challenge, because I succeeded in, 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 in uh, being ahead of the, of the next generation. That's what probably never happened before. And uh, that's what probably kept Fischer outside of chess, because he, he was not sure he could beat Karpov in, in 1975. And so the second peak was probably 99, 2000. Uh, again, that was the, the, uh, the, uh, my uh, ELA rating record, 2851. Uh, which is still um, way above the, 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 even the, 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 the level of the best players. And, um, and then I lost the World Championship match, probably also inevitable because whether you like it or not, but subconsciously you become complacent. Mm -hmm. So just, uh, no, I don't, I, even if you understand everything, at a at certain point, you know, you, um, you lose your determination. So you want to say, you know, you want to optimize your game or your business. And you don't want to make any changes. So, and again, if you don't disrupt your business, other people do. So. <laughs> Rudy, don't get complacent. No, 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 no. And everybody, that's, that's, that, that's. I've learned that. Yeah, that's the problem. Now, that's, it happens with everybody, yeah. So, 
And uh, then it was the last challenge for me after losing this match. And the irony is, you know, this, I haven't lost the match because I was, I was going down. I lost the match in the middle of my uh, 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 longest winning streak in the, tournament, in the tournaments. I won 10 tournaments, and that was exactly in the middle. So after losing the match, I won a few more top tournaments. And then, again, probably it, it's, it's inevitable. Maybe just, you know, it's, um, it's in the human nature. So at a certain point, you lose your passion to sort of uh, um, search for new horizons. Because for me, chess was not just about winning or losing, so not for IBM, yes. Uh, uh, I wanted to, uh, to make the difference. I wanted to find something new. I wanted to make a contribution to the game. And at one point, I recognized that already I did more than I could have ever thought of. And uh, by 2002, 2003, I was mentally preparing myself to uh, to do something else. Thank you. Well, the next question relates to how we could do something new and inspirational. We once believed that if we could build computers to play chess or pass the Turing test, we would gain valuable insight into human cognition. We were wrong. Is there a new challenge that can inspire us to create machines that are truly intelligent? Um, yeah, because, because practical chess uh, um, was solved by you know, a simple increase in, 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 in uh, brute force of calculation. So there was no need to, to look for, for, a, for another pass, you know, just to make, to make intelligent machines. But I, I, I believe that chess is, is a unique playing field to, to look for the combination of, this, of, of the machine's power and, uh, and uh, a human, human, human's abilities. So it's like, you know, to... Um, to solve the Moravitz paradox, you know, so because it's exactly, you know, what happens, you know, we are good at something that machines are bad at, and vice versa. So uh, by creating this the platform for, uh, uh, so for human intuition to be added to machines' brutal force of calculation, I think chess uh, uh, um, uh, computers, uh, I mean, th this, this kind of competition could offer some assistance to those who are working on. Uh, on, 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 uh, on other things, uh, because I think it's just what's happening with, even with the search, so you want to optimize it, but you don't use the, uh, uh, the, the let's say, the visual power of, of, of a human. Now, let's say you have the... I can't talk about no, it. No, 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 but it's just, <laughs> you say that's this, the, if you have O'Reilly books, I don't want to use Paris Hilton, which is, you know, it's, it's, okay. it's, 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 very, it's, too, it's too known, but O'Reilly books, you know, in the search, so you, you will be, yeah, you will be dealing with two two different elements. Okay. So uh, let's say you know you have a simple visual on, uh, uh, above the search, with you know one is the, the the Fox News logo and one is a computer. So it can immediately the human takes you know probably a, a split of a second to separate. Mm -hmm. So just clicking the, clicking one button. So with a machine it takes much longer. So in chess you know that's 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 a good playing field to identify how you can do these things by 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 by. Uh, adding this, 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 uh, the human insight to the machine's power. Right. But if you take that further and assume humans can bootstrap the algorithm by looking at any one specific result and saying, this could be improved by doing X or Y, how do you then scale that in such a way that you can take those human insights into what the bootstrapping human would do to the algorithm and then make the algorithm? Yeah, but you're not, you know, it's the... Uh, I'm not talking about, you know, sort of the merging it. I'm talking about the interface, you know, so how to, you add it. Uh, uh, um, you know, because you know that machines are very good at something, so, but they're not good at recognizing the visuals. So, and that's, that's what's one, one example. And I believe there are many other examples. It's, all, it's more about interface rather than the merge. Hmm. Okay. Okay, next question. Здравствуйте. Welcome. Добрый день. Добрый день. Yes. Um, so I have a question about intuition and gut feeling. And um, so the question is, do you ever rely on a gut feeling and intuition and make a decision in chess? And do you think such thing exists? Oh, it, it does exist. Okay. Is it valid? Is it valid? It's the most valuable uh, quality of a human being, in my view. Yeah. Um, it's. You know, we probably we leave it at a time when we want, you know, just to touch something before we can make our opinion about, about the subject. I believe that the intuition is, is, is like any, any other muscle. So, like, people know that if you go to the gym, you know, you, 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 you sort of improve your, your physical conditions. They know that the training memory 
It's, you know, there are also exercises. But intuition is the same, and so you, you, have to, you have to learn how to trust your intuition. My view is that, you know, uh, we, uh, we uh, severely undermine the importance of intuition because intuition means, you know, taking too much risk. And we, you know, whether we like it or not, we live in a you know, risk-averse culture. Yeah, and um, uh, intuitive decision uh, very often cannot be explained in the terms that should be required by corporate culture or by your family, other family members. So, um, in my view, you know, by, you know, by adding this, the quality of intuition to the decision-making process, we can dramatically improve the results. Okay. So, I see Stephen is way in the back of the line, but winning the chess championship under 18 should allow you to cut in the line. Yeah. <laughs> um, to be clear, it doesn't mean you get a job at Google, yeah. but you do get to ask a question. How important would you say psychology is in chess? Basically, like playing against an individual opponent's weaknesses, and what limitations would you say this puts on computers? Uh, the, the psychology is, 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 uh, is an imminent element of, of any game between individuals because you know we we know uh, uh, we know that uh, our opponents they have has some strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and uh, looking at the games, you can analyze uh, these potential weaknesses. And uh, if you have two very strong players uh, are facing each other in the match, uh, then the winner is very likely not, you know, someone who comes up with just a brand new idea, brand new idea, but someone who could push the game in the, in, 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 into the direction um, uh, that is that that will suit his strengths and will undermine. His weaknesses. It's like you know, uh, if you use a metaphor from uh, 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 the military metaphor. So in in a medieval battlefield, if you have cavalry, you're looking for for a valley. If you're fighting the, against cavalry, you'll be looking for the hills. So it's about creating the environment where your your strengths will manifest and your weaknesses. And again, all weaknesses are relative because when I relative when I play and played Anatoly Karpov, we were very good at almost everything. But still, you know. I was more dynamic player, he was more strategic, so it was very important to sort of push the game in a direction that could fit you know, my, my playing style more than, than, than his. And um, that's why, that, 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 this is the element of psychology. And by the way, it could actually work uh, in, 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 uh, um, in a very strange way when you're facing the computer. Because many computers, even today, they still have their own, you know, their own strengths and own weaknesses. And uh, if you can understand it, so it may help you to sort of design uh, the game, which would be the most um, um, unpleasant for for a certain computer. <laughs> no, it's because it's actually machine. It's, it might you know it might sound very odd, but machine definitely has a quote unquote personality, and it very much depends on, on on the people behind the computer. So some of the machines are playing you know more aggressive chess, some are playing less aggressive chess. And again, it's, I don't know whether it's an irony or not, but the Israeli-made computer is more aggressive than a German-made computer. <laughs> He's challenging Silicon Valley great Jim Barksdale, who basically said, who wins in a fight between an alligator and a bear? It depends if it's in a swamp or the forest. <laughs> Thank you. Now, how do you jump to the Dory, and then we'll do the next yeah. one here. How do you avoid making mistakes and maintain your peak performance in a long session of chess games? Uh, I mean, let's forget about avoiding mistakes. I mean, <laughs> we don't make mistakes, we're dead. I mean, so just it's the making mistakes is a normal decision-making process. And yeah. again, I, yeah, no, I, I want to refer again to, the, to this risk averse culture because what is this in, in business and life? You know, we want to limit you know, our ability to make mistakes. It's just making mistakes is like a crime. No, it's a normal part of the thinking process. So uh, uh, limiting mistake, mistakes, I think it's just, it's, it's first, you know, you have to kill the fear. So less you, you, you fear of making mistakes, you know, it, just, it dramatically reduces the chances that you will make one. Because most of the mistakes, they have a psychological root. So it just, it's, you, 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 you can't display all your abilities to, to make the right decision. So uh, I, um, I believe that uh, the, the, the dominant uh, player at the chessboard in the, in the long match was one who could uh, 
be more resolute in the decision making, so more confident in making, in ma in making decisions. And as for the physical stamina, when I play chess, I spend you know, quite a lot of time by training myself because I believe that the, the physical conditions were quite important to keep your, uh, sort of your psychology at the, at, the, at the right level. It's just, it boosted, it always boosted my confidence. Now he's channeling Eric Schmidt, don't be afraid to fail, an excuse I've used regularly for the last 10 years. <laughs> it's, 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 I, I would even, you know, I would even go further, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's afraid is just, it's, it's some kind of, you know, it's defensive. It's more, more aggressive. I mean, you, you have to damn sure you will, you will fail at a certain point. So just r recognizing that you, some kind of failure is inevitable, I think, helps you to boost your performance. Hmm. Very good. Actually, let me have a suggestion, because I, I have an idea for you that might improve chess. I was thinking about My chess? Before. No, chess as a whole. <laughs> uh, so the problem with chess, one problem is that it's hard to make a living out of it. Only the top, very, very top player in the world can make a living because there's no... Because chess, um, is, chess is not a very professional right. game, yes. And well, it's, because it's hard it's, for people it's to by, follow. It's run by people with very sort of uh, limited reputation. Besides the politics of chess, <laughs> if you look at poker, for example, poker got to be extremely popular because they figure out a trick that people can watch it by showing some secret information that's not available to the players. What if you do something like this with chess, where after every game, after every move, the player will go aside to a soundproof room and say exactly what he wants to do and what he thinks the opponent will want to do. So and then the winner will be not just a winner, but who managed who to vote, guess better. Who will be voted, who will voted by but, the public, yes. <laughs> but, right. but the question is, that might be viewable. People might want to watch it, because it's very interesting you to know, see who know, guessed better, the, no, who knew the, better, and what you know, was. One of the, it's the, uh, this man, man plus machine chess, what I introduced in 1998, I called the dance chess. One of the ideas was that, you know, when you go through this process, you know, you, we have the same, uh, we have access to the same hardware, we can choose our software, mm -hmm. but we go through some lines and analyze it. On the screen, that we can, we don't see the screen, on the screen you actually could see the whole process, you know, what I'm looking at. So right. it's, I was, I had this kind of an idea that at certain point we have to share it with the, with, with the general public, uh, but, Still, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, difficult, you know, uh, to uh, explain all these um, uh, combinations and, and the ideas behind, behind every move. Because in poker, you know, just look at the numbers. You know, the machine immediately gives you those. So that's it. So the rest is, is psychology and, uh, and, uh, and you don't have to sort of mobilize your brains to understand what's going on. Sure, but psychology, <laughs> psychology is kind of interesting and in fact, well, there is a computer that plays very well in chess. There is no one that plays poker. Very yeah, well. because, it's kind of interesting, because no, it's mostly no, no, psychology. Machine, machine gives you odds, but machine, again, same, same problem. How do you translate into a bluff into numbers? So the element okay. of bluff, you know, definitely creates, creates sort of a, it's a gray zone. So for twilight zone for the computer. Absolutely. Okay. Do you have an idea? How to, how to decode bluff? How to decode bluff? <laughs> Well, you do your odds and you sometimes but, uh, the, but this randomly odds, decide no, but, uh, when. But, 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 but the, the, the whole idea of, okay, the, 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 the best players, they, 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 they base their bluff on, on reading whatever information they can read from the face of the opponent. So again, how you, how you can translate it into the numbers. Of course, that's why it's hard. Go ahead. Go ahead. Many people consider great chess players as talented, intelligent, or gifted. And you have been trained by, uh, you had been trained by Botvinnik, and you have helped many players to get better, and you have improved a lot during your career. So, uh, how much percentage do you think in the chess ability that is contributed by the talent and how much percentage by the hard work and practice? Um, uh, it's a very vague question because are you talking about the world champions or, or just chess players in general? Okay, if I, if I say, okay, just consider yourself, we cannot distinguish. You have seen many, uh, many players, somebody might have you know. Yeah, but it's this, let me say, to become the world champion, you need an exceptional talent. It may not be enough, but it should be there for you to become 
number one, or at least you know, maybe top five, let's say. So uh, uh, I cannot give you, again, exact you know, um, uh, level one can achieve without having unique talent. But definitely, there is a certain level that can be achieved if you have sort of ordinary talent. You still have to have some talent for chess. But uh, the, the correlation between these numbers, I don't know. But undoubtedly, you need a talent. But some players with unique talent never became the champions because it also needs character, maybe some element of luck, and the ability to work hard. Uh, but talent you know, is, is, um, is, is a number one condition for you to become the best in the world, or one of the best in the world. Thank you. Right. Sure. We've talked a little bit about uh, the game of chess and as far as studying it with computers. Uh, now, with the advancement of computers to the point that they can brute force a game of chess, how do you feel this has affected uh, the, the game on the, the higher level, you know, with the, the newer generations of chess players? Um, it's, um, again, probably was inevitable, but it's, it's some kind of computerized uh, mentality because they they look at certain geometry of the of of of, of, of the board. So it's it's this uh, these geometrical assumptions they replace strategic understanding uh, uh, because they they learn a lot at very early age. Today, 12, 13 year old kid knows much more about chess than Bobby Fischer did in 1972 because you know just if he knows how to use the mouse. So you go through the yeah through this these millions of games and you absorb the information, but Learning this information doesn't mean that you can understand it, and uh, uh, let's not forget that many things that this kid learns today, they were invented by Bobby Fischer, because Bobby Fischer was the first one actually to, not to invent them, but to sort of to, to, to bring, it, bring them to life. And uh, uh, many of these, uh, the technical ideas, not only the opening, but also in, 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 in the middle game. So um, I think that uh, uh, today we have uh, young chess players, and the average age is definitely getting younger. So, at between six years, 50 years, 60 years ago, the, uh, the peak of the chess player was 35, 40 years. When, you know, that's why I was the youngest one uh, to win the world championship at age 22. So uh, if you look at the, at the modern chess, now Magnus Carlsen, number one rated player, he, just, he will be turning uh, 20 at the end of this month. So uh, chess is getting younger, but they, um, uh, they gain this information, they become very, very strong players, but probably at the expense of a sort of less comprehensive approach. It's very natural. I don't think that if you look somewhere else, you will not see the same phenomenon. Thank you. So if we just shift to another subject I know you're interested in. After you retired in 2005, you ran for political office. Uh, uh, or suggested... You know, with the... I, I'm not an American citizen, I live in Russia. So in Russia, we're not trying to win elections, we're trying to have elections. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're also particularly interested in trying to have change. I think you yeah, mentioned Yeah, well, that's exactly the change I want, I want so my you, country to, to implement, you know, just to have Russian people to speak when they don't like the, the course of the country, as it happened here, you know, 24 hours ago. Uh, and um, so far, we, yeah, we haven't, we haven't uh, succeeded, but I believe that you know, this is the only way for my country to survive in this harsh reality of the 21st century. So you mentioned at a protest, I think, a week or so ago. No, well, that, it's, uh, it's a constant Putin, protest. It's not, again, not as big as in France, but definitely less violent. I think you said Putin and his cabinet should resign. It, and, yes, it must resign. And you've had some predictions that you've gone on the record, maybe in 2008, saying they wouldn't make it through 2012. Uh, I you still believe that? I still hope so. It depends, it depends very much on the situation in the country, but uh, also it depends, very, it depends uh, a lot on the oil prices, because that what, that, that, this influx of money props up the Putin regime, since the uh, Russian economy and the, the in, it's, it's not in good shape, and the infrastructure, mostly Soviet-built infrastructure, is about to collapse. If you travel outside of Moscow, a bit, uh, not in Skolko, I mean, but somewhere else, you know, further down, you will just recognize that this country, it's like, it's like traveling in a time machine. You will see that most of the country still lives in a very dire conditions. And if you could achieve the kind of regime that you think the people would like, what changes would you make to address these issues? Look, uh, definitely, you know, this, uh, 
the, uh, the wealth created in the country should be used not to buy soccer clubs in England or basketball clubs in the United States, uh, but to, to, to be invested in Russia. And we have hundreds of billions of dollars being you know, invested or taken out of the country by Russian oligarchs, and I believe that this money can be wisely used to, to improve conditions of, of our vast country. Should we go back here? I think that gentleman is first. Oh, all right, wow. yes. It's I'm, second I'm one. not looking to my right. <laughs> We're outflanked. So, uh, I saw an interview we'll for a last year about uh, training Magnus Carlsen, and they briefly mentioned the idea of the level of discipline that it takes to compete at the highest levels. I was wondering if you could elaborate on, as an instructor of, of such a student, um, how do you bring about that, those levels of focus and, de and determination that it takes to get to the top? Um, yeah, I would be very cautious using the words instructor and student, you know, to describe my relations with Magnus. Um, what I think I did, and I was quite happy, is that I, mm, I helped him to learn how to study the game of chess. That's the, that, that was one of the unique things I learned also from Botvinnik, and it's the, the uh, value of being part of the Soviet chess school when the experience was um, transmitted from generation to generation. And uh, Magnus, as I, just, I, I was talking about, about this phenomena just a few minutes ago, uh, he learned a lot by, you know, by just you know, uh, clicking the mouse. So he uh, got an appetite for starting the game of chess the way I did. And I think it was very, very helpful because it helped him to expand his horizons. Also, what helped me to work with Magnus is that his chess style is, is or his natural talent is different from mine. So it's more like Karpov. He's a very quiet positional player with a very good, uh, uh, with, a, with, with a phenomenal ability to actually recognize sort of the, the, um, the uh, positional elements in each position. I'm very sharp and dynamic player, so he can learn how to do other things in chess. So it was a very good um, sort of extra value added to, to, to uh, his chess education. So I enjoyed it immensely, and I'm very happy to see that, you know, my work um, uh, uh, produced um, such um, um, impressive results. One more from the neglected line over here, I guess. <laughs> So much of Google's technology works on the notion of the wisdom of the crowds as displayed by the web, the connectivity of uh, web pages, et cetera. Yet the games of when you played against the world and what recently when Magnus Carlsen played against the world, the world showed a rather fractured uh, approach to the playing style. Can you uh, uh, say anything more about this or, or uh, elaborate upon why you think that might be? Yes. but. Um... I think we have been dealing with, especially the game you mentioned, Magnus Carlsen played with the world. Um, it's a very special exercise because it's not, you know, the, not about generality. So there's the, uh, and uh, you can't install these big numbers to, to ensure the quality of, 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 of the decision. Uh, when Magnus played the world, there were three grandmasters, relatively strong grandmasters, but still weaker than Magnus, offering the moves. So, and what's happened is that these moves, uh, uh, very often they were contradicting each other because they played their own games. So, uh, um, adding players to the process uh, didn't help to improve the quality of the decisions. When I actually, I played a Microsoft match when we had not two minutes per move, but two days to make a move. Uh, that game was probably one of the best, ever, best um, games ever played because the, the, the group, uh, of, of the strong chess players, they created a very powerful algorithm by, by using computers, it's about the process also, and picking up the, 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 the best moves. And at a certain point, uh, the game was simply phenomenal, and uh, I, I just still don't understand how they could make this terrible blunder at the very end, probably this complacency. Yeah, and, uh, and they lost, but uh, the game actually had to end up in a draw, and it was a very, very high quality game. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. Dobrodin, I have a bit of a philosophical question for you. Earlier you said that... You mean the others were in, uh, not intelligent, yes, the question. <laughs> they were very intelligent. This one probably is not intelligent. Earlier you said that um, any computer can beat any player today by analyzing... No, I didn't say any computer, I didn't say any player. I said just the strongest computer, okay, but... A strong computer can beat any chess player today by analyzing 
any of the 10 to the 120th possibilities of moves. No, 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 I didn't say that. Did, did, yeah. Udi, please help. You know, did I say that? No. <laughs> 10, yeah. 10 to the 20? No. <laughs> 10 to 120 is all the possible moves ever, ever. possible in chess. OK, but if a computer can analyze all those moves, it can potentially be but any Can you imagine the number, player. 10 to the power 120? Yeah. I can. <laughs> big number. Big? It's more money than we make. <laughs> It's even more than Bernanke <laughs> Prince, yes? Okay. The question that I have is, if a computer can beat a human, it seems to me like chess is a game that's deterministic. There's no chance. There's no free will. Do you think that your mind works the same way, that it's deterministic? Do you think that uh, works the same but, way? But again, let, let's, let's, let's move back to, the, to, the, to, the, uh, to uh, the limitations of the game of chess. So uh, probably the, 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 the number of all legal moves probably was the wrong example. But right now, if you look at the, at the um, end games analyzed by the computers, the computers solved all four pieces end games, so, uh, in, including kings. So that's why. Then solved all five pieces end games. I think they solved most, probably all, almost all six pieces. Now they are just approaching seven pieces. I'm not sure it will happen soon, if it happens at all. Maybe the limits will be eight pieces. Now, the maybe, because the numbers, it's, it's, you start looking at this now, they, they grow exponentially. Uh, now, the chess game is an ultimate end game of 32 pieces. So that's why there's, there's no chance a game of chess can be solved. I mean, theoretically, cannot, it cannot be solved. But what happens is that the game played by the humans is not perfect. So um, one of the biggest problems the human strongest human player uh, um, uh, uh, experiences while playing the strong or relatively strong computer is the different level of uh, resilience. When we play, two humans play the game. So, and I'm getting, so I have a superior position. Very often, this psychology works now in my favor because my opponent is losing his will to, to, to uh, uh, sort of to defend. And uh, very, it's, in, in chess, we say that the, the mistakes uh, do not work alone. So you always have you know, more mistakes because it's a, it's a pressure. So uh, winning the game of chess between two humans doesn't require the same energy as to beat a machine because machine doesn't care. So it's the, when you look, whether it's a good position or a bad position, it starts from each, you know, uh, every, every move it starts from the scratch. So um, uh, when, uh, uh, when um, uh, you play the machine, uh, you have to make sure that, that the quality of all your moves, all, literally all your moves, will be almost perfect. It doesn't happen in, in, in the game of chess. When you look at even at the best games, let's say I played against Karpov or Kramnik played against Anon, I bet you you will find maybe not mistakes but inaccuracies. So inaccuracy is, is, is a natural, is some kind of a small mistake, is, is, is a natural part of any decision-making process. Against the machine, is deadly. Because small inaccuracy could kill the result of, of your very hard work that, that, that you, um, all you accomplished in, in the previous two or three or four hours of, 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 of a game. Don't you think those mistakes are also deterministic in your mind, though? That but, they're based on say, some sort of decision or some past experience? Or? No, it's just, again, it's the mistakes, you know, it's part of uh, whatever, you know, whatever weaknesses we, can, we, we are performing at a certain moment. You could be tired. You, your mind can be uh, blind by whatever, by family problems or a crash of the stock market, so whatever. So you have a lot of problems. So we, we, we have a fundamental problem of concentrating all our abilities to, to, to this specific problem. And uh, um, I believe that if we, to continue this experiment, man playing versus machine, it should, that we should change the rules and a key uh, um, alteration uh, um, should be related to, 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 um, um, to the overall result. Uh, it could be four games match, six games match, eight games match. But we understand that uh, the longer we play, so the, the, the better chance for the computer because it will play almost steady game while humans could, you know, the, the quality will fluctuate. I believe that what we have to find out is whether the best human player at his peak can beat the best computer. So if human player wins one game, that's it. Because we don't have to, 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 to uh, look for the, longer, uh, for the long competition to, to prove that we're better. 
It's very important to find out that at the peak of our performance, we're still capable of competing or even beating a strong computer, which is very, very difficult now. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, hi, my name hi. is Mila. Uh, first of all, Gary, thanks so much for coming over to Google to visit us. And um, let me shift the subject back to politics again, if you don't mind. I have two questions. What's your take on Khodorkovsky's case? And do you think the justice will prevail in the outcome of his trial in December this year? Um, we do not have elections in Russia. We do not have justice in Russia. So I am quite pessimistic about the outcome of this trial which is a shame for my country, and it's a tragedy for, for uh, Khodorkovsky and the employees of UCAS, which again, I'm not sure how audience here is, how much people know about this case, but UCAS was the most successful oil company in Russia. By the way, the most transparent oil company in Russia, the company that paid most taxes per barrel of oil. And uh, because of this success of, Khodor of um, Mikhail Khodorkovsky and his team, and his willingness to merge with multinational corporations and, and to bring this transparency to Russia and to make it a standard. I believe that's why the company was ruined and it ended up in the hands of Mr. Putin's cronies. Uh, I made this very um, uh, um, uh, uh, green prediction in 2004. As long as Putin stays in power, Khodorkovsky stays in jail. And uh, now it's a second trial. It is, it's, it uh, makes even, even uh, Kafka pale by comparison, because first time Khodorkovsky was convicted for not paying taxes. Now he's convicted for stealing the, everything, uh, uh, all, the entire oil production the Yugos is extracted. And in fact, you know, uh, if, he, if he didn't pay the taxes from that, how he could steal it? So that's the, 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 it, 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 the, the whole process. Is, is, uh, is, 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 is a terrible display of uh, a lack of uh, rule of law in Russia and uh, um, cruelty of Putin's regime and uh, also corruption because I already said uh, uh, UCAS and its most uh, precious parts of the company now owned by, by Putin's closest, uh, closest friends. I hope that Khodorkovsky can uh, leave jail alive because this is one of the most uh, um, brilliant executives in Russia and uh, hopefully one day you know his, his talent could help the country uh, 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 to come back to the civilized world. So is the internet and online tools and access to information and information transparency and the kind of things that we tend to preach here as being the lifeblood of democracy, are these things helping increase the odds that there's going to be change in, in Russia, or are they simply allowing the existing regime to reinforce its hold on power? Um, now, internet it plays a very important role in uh, beefing up the opposition in Russia. We don't have the same phenomena as in China. So the Russian authorities, they, uh, uh, they are not as aggressive in limiting the internet access, because it's very much part of this Putin's, not a deal, but is the, his philosophy in dealing with the, with the population. Uh, private life is some kind of guaranteed unless you are, you are interfering with politics. So as long as you, you, you don't mind Putin's business by robbing the country, your personal life will not be uh, uh, under any threat. So that's why Internet has been rapidly growing in Russia. I think now the number is 41 or 42 million people somehow connected to the Internet in Russia. Uh, but obviously, not more than 10% of this crowd, and those numbers probably, they, they are similar to the rest of the world, 10% are interested one or another in politics. Uh, and out of this 10%, maybe one third to a half could be interested in reading alternative source of information. So that's why the, uh, the audience which is related to our websites, and we have very few websites uh, in Russia because the media, uh, the mainstream media is under 100% under control of, of Kremlin. So we have about a million and a half, two million people uh, following uh, what we are doing, and it's, but this number grows. 
So that's why you see more and more people in the Moscow streets or St. Petersburg. And what is very important, the information exchange. Now, anything that happens in Vladivostok or in Siberia or in the Urals or in other parts of Russia, very, very uh, soon makes, its, makes the news, but on the internet uh, uh, sites in, in, in Moscow. Okay. So we're almost out of time, but maybe we have time for one more question here. Hi. Uh, you wrote a book called How Life Imitates Chess, and you've talked about peak performance in other areas, whether it's business, politics, et cetera. Um, is it constructive to think about um, life as a game? And if so, can you share your secret for winning the game of life? <laughs> No, I, winning game of life. Wow. Uh, is that, <laughs> what, what does that mean? Is that what peak performance is, to, to view it in that way? Can you talk about how somebody would go about achieving peak performance in other areas other than chess? Uh, I, um, when I wrote the book, you know, I had an idea of just starting a dialogue with, with, um, with an individual who um, had a desire to improve his or her performance in decision making. What I always didn't like is just to provide a universal advice. So somehow it goes against this, the conventional wisdom that you can have an advice how to improve your performance. I believe that we all, we all are different, we're all unique. And uh, something that may work for me will not work for you. So it's very important that we start analyzing our own performance and looking for, as we've talked about today already, about strengths and weaknesses. And then you, know, you create your own formula, which might be not working for me. And, uh, when people, you know, are trying to analyze their own performance, sometimes they get upset if they look at, you know, their quality and say, oh, I'm too arrogant or, or I'm just very defensive. It doesn't make any difference, you know. You could be uh, a very good in attack. You could be very good in defense. At the end of the day, you have to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at. So you can have a tennis player with a very powerful serve, you know, who's rushing to the net, and someone who plays very defensively. Both could be number one. It's very important that you look inside first. That's, the, that's, that's my advice. I, when I hear, you know, this is uh, some of the, uh, sort of the big names in the industry providing, you know, the audience in the massive, uh, the huge audience with this, with this, you know, a tip, an advice that can work for everybody. I don't think it's, it's they're doing a good service because we are different. And by, without recognizing, you know, what's inside of us, we cannot uh, come up with, 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 with the right um, decision-making formula. It may not be winning at the end of the day, but uh, I believe that you know it's 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 all it's it's all up to us to make all the difference. So and uh, I think that we, almost all of us, probably all of us, we underperform because there's a huge potential. And uh, what keeps us, uh, you know, um, uh, um, uh, what keeps us behind is is the fear to make mistakes. So it's about courage. So, and again, we're going back to, these, to, to, to the modern culture. So, I, you know, uh, if you look at back in, in the history timeline, so this, the, the great explorers, I mean, it's today I don't think Magellan and Columbus could get, you know, venture capital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, the, it's, it's very important to understand that, you know, by the, 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 the uh, I mean, you can't expect, you know, let's say 10% annual return uh, without taking risk. So otherwise, you know, we move into, in, into the Bernie Madoff's world. So we, we have to take more risk. We have to recognize that risk and mistakes, they are inevitable for those who want to make progress. So um, it's, 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 it's another, it's, it's, it's a, a very long story. Actually, I'm working on another book now uh, with my friends, was Peter Thiel and Max Levchin. Uh, and it's uh, tentative title is The World of Fake Values. And we talk about what we believe is the, I'm afraid to say, your technological stagnation of, of modern, in, in modern days. And it's very much related to, to, to um, complacency and the risk averse culture. So, and um, I, I'm used to take risk and I did it all my life. And I believe that, you know, that what can help us to start pushing things, you know, uh, forward. Okay, if you're looking for more answers, please buy all of his books. <laughs> so, Let's all thank Gary for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.